Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, everybody. We're happy to be here. My name is Dialect. I have I am from Pockets Change. We're a hip hop and finance organization based in the United States, although we're pretty global. We've written curricula for people like Visa, the FDIC, and even the entire national financial curriculum for the country of Uganda. I have my partner, Saria Idan, here. Hey, Saria, say hello, folks. Hello, folks. Can y'all hear me? I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you good. Sorry, is a multi-talented performer, musician, educator, movement specialist, healer. You got too, too, too many things. You know, one of the things about finance, you know, when our parents were coming up, we were told to find a skill or a trade, one thing that you can do that will make you financially secure. But nowadays they say it's the hustle and it's the multitask. And so we have to have many sorts of ideas and schemes for us to make some money. Now, I was talking a little bit before about pockets change and what we do. We do hip hop and finance, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we make rap songs about finance. We do that too, because it's fun. But our approach is about financial resilience, like Megan was talking about earlier. And to be able to build financial resilience, we have five steps. We're gonna talk about this briefly. I wanna get into a couple of fun things that we do so we can get the ideas behind how we create our rhythm. In a couple of minutes, we're gonna do a jam together. Earlier this morning, you saw us getting down with the breathing and rhythm, finding your money mantra. And this is how you build these things. By the way, before we Hello. get started, I want to, hey, 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 what's going on? Welcome, welcome. I want to let y'all know this is not a save your questions till the end type of party. Feel free to keep yourself muted while you're listening. But if you have a question, feel free to unmute or answer in chat. We will be able to be paying attention to all of these things. So for hip hop and finance, the first thing that we do want to do is start buy-in conversations to build the cipher. The thing about building a cipher rather than a lecture when it comes to creating financial understanding what folks is meeting people where they're at. Lectures are top down. Lectures are hierarchical. Lectures about expertise and power. But when it comes to being able to find your own flow with money, you need to be able to listen to yourself and your vibe. So we create a cipher. So that's a more circular situation where the leaders are based on the situation. Once we get that stuff together, the next thing is to do is financial systems and understand financial systems because on the real, a lot of financial systems weren't meant to help you. Banks don't exist to just give you a loan so you can buy a house. Banks want to make money on their own and they will help you as a consequence. Some of them do many harmful things, but you still need to use them if you want to get that house or that car or achieve that financial independence. So we examine those financial systems to see what the rhythm of the room is and how we can share it. Once we've got that stuff together, then we are building habits by discovering our own personal rhythm. After that, we are taking advocacy. You know, um, to give you just a little bit of reality about me and mine, uh, when I was a kid, my mom told me not to send a burger back at a restaurant because they would spit in your food. And what that translates to is being unable to advocate for myself. When I see a funny number on a phone bill, I'm like, oh, I don't want to bother them. We're taught to be small. So we need to find ways to learn how to advocate for ourselves. And once you can find a way to advocate for yourself, then figure out your values. What's important to you? What matters to you? So let's get going with that. I noticed that was on the wrong thing here. You would see in my browser. I want to share that our expectations and reality when it comes to personal finance never line up. If people tell you that it's like, what? You get a good job. You go to the right school. You get a good internship. You make some connections. Success, right? You're rich and it's all good. That's not the reality. The reality is a lot messier. And it's not just that your finances are going to be messy. Your understanding of what we've been talking about today for this entire FinFET, there's a lot been going on, the spiritual, the emotional, the artistic, what we're going to be talking about with you today. Some of this stuff's going to be really relevant and you can do it right now. Some of the stuff's not going to be that relevant or it's relevant, but you can't deal with it right now. Or you start doing it and you get tired or you get distracted or somebody gets sick or you get sick and you have to deal with other things. I want you to remember that we are paying attention to the big black triangle and not worried about the silly string that got us there. It's a whole lot of mess that brings us to the places that we are and that is what builds us and our financial selves. So why do we need to change the way we're doing finance? I know a lot of people think that they need to change the way they're doing finance because they're not rich. And it's not just that, it's that we don't have equitable financial situations anywhere. Uh, one of the things we wanted to wrap about in the United States, we have the racial wealth divide where statisticians have determined that it would take 242 years for the average black family to catch up to the wealth of the average white family. Those are median scores for my stat nerds out there. And what that basically means is 
in terms of wealth, right now things are getting worse and worse for people of color, and particularly for Black people. There is a, a worry that by 2053, the average wealth of a Black family may be zero. And while education is not a silver bullet, it's not the only thing that people need, it certainly is important and helpful. And you know this because of the lack of it in poor communities and in communities of color. So another stat we see here, only 7.4% of black and brown students have access to financial literacy. And only 7.8% of low income students of any ethnicity have access to financial literacy. So even though it's not the thing that is going to save us like it's magic, it is a starting point that we definitely need to get going on. And one of the things that we wanna to do to ask y'all, if you don't learn anything else today, please learn a lot. We all been working hard on this, but if you don't learn anything else today, learn that we need to start talking to each other about money. There are jobs, and many of you have probably worked those jobs where there are contracts that say, if you talk about your salary, you will be fired. I have worked as an independent music, theater, film, education, a professional in many different industries. And I can't tell you how many times a nightclub owner or a producer or a promoter would tell me, hey, if you talk about the money that you're making with the fellow artists, with the punk rockers, with the singers and all that, they're going to take your gig. They taught me not to talk about mm -hmm. money. And what happened was, is it just flew out of my pockets and they took advantage of someone else when I got tired. So I want you find a money buddy today. Find someone that you can talk to, maybe somebody brand new to you, maybe somebody that you've known for a long time. I have my money, buddy. Sorry, I've been talking a lot of mess. So sorry. Why don't you tell me about what talking about finances meant to you? Well, it, it helped me to not feel embarrassed, right? And um, it helped me to feel empowered to ask questions, not just of colleagues and friends and family, but also to feel more empowered to ask specific questions like when I'm setting up a bank account at a new bank or credit union, mm -hmm. right? Just to like get, get, um, it makes it easier to talk about money, period, if you have somebody to confide in. Right and to share process with because we need to learn how to advocate for ourselves and when if we don't talk to each other then advocating for ourselves and. Um, asking for what we're actually worth as artists and entrepreneurs is even more challenging. That is the real uh, you know I really appreciate how you were talking about embarrassment, there is this idea that we're supposed to know everything about money, Word. even though we weren't taught everything about money and that's the stuff that leaves us feeling like we're stupid like we're wrong like we're alone. And I wanna make sure that y'all know that we are not stupid, we are not wrong, we are not alone. But what we are gonna do, apologies for my folks who've got trauma around their schooling, but we're gonna take a quiz. <laughs> it's an easy quiz, right? Sorry, it's an easy quiz. It's, a it's an quiz. easy quiz, it's an easy quiz. It's only two questions. <laughs> it's only two questions. If you want to send someone else this quiz, I'll put this in the chat. And I mean, actually, sorry, you could use it in the chat. It's pocketschange.com yeah, yeah. slash personality. But it's just a two question quiz. I would like you to answer. The answer is A or B for these two questions. I would like you to put them in the chat once you have them together. So the first question is, which phrase do you relate to more? A, I think about the money I have now. It's not real until it's in my hands. Or B, I'm usually spending the money in my head before I even get it. If you're not ready to start sharing with everybody in the chat, that's okay. Just write it down for yourself. Take about 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. think too hard. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we got a number of people put down there. If you haven't gotten there, again, you can go on the website and check it out. The second question, and this relates to your finances, but also other things in your personal life could work as well. Is it A, I tend to plan ahead? or B, I tend to deal with things as they come.
Hey, looks like we got some answers there. Everybody put down, make sure that you've got your first answer, your second answer, A, B, and A or B. You either gonna have an AA, AB, BA, or BB as your final score. And this brings up our money personalities. These are, you know, I don't really like personality tests. I know I just gave you all the personality tests, but I tend to not like personality tests because personality tests often try to tell you who you are. And the reality is that uh, we can't tell you who you are. We can only tell you about the things that are happening to you and your tendencies when it comes to your actions. As you look at these, I don't want you to start feeling like this is the totality of your being. I don't want you to start worrying about, should I change this? Oh, I need to have the better one. There is no better one. There is no best one. These are just your tendencies. That angel and devil on your shoulder or non-denominational entity, depending on your religion, uh, sitting on your shoulder that are telling you what to do in any financial situation. These are your money personalities and we have to understand them, recognize them and deal with them so we can have a bit of understanding. Now, if you answered A for one and A for two, you might be a complicator. Complicators thing is, you know, more money, more problems. Complicators are super smart about money. These are the people who like spreadsheets. These are the people who like budgets. The complicators, they look at their finances all the time, three, four times a day. They will check their, if, if they go and pay a bill and they don't see that it went through, they'll check and call in and make sure all this is going on. They have wealth of information. The thing that I worry about with complicators is all that information oftentimes causes analysis paralysis, where you've seen all of it, but you don't know what to do because you're so worried about what's going to happen with your money. With complicators, we suggest for y'all to find a way to let go. Can you take one of your bills and put it on auto pay? And just know that it's on auto pay. Now, I know those of y'all who are real for real complicators in the room, you just got a little bit nervous when I said that. Right. Because I was like, oh, you got we, we got to let take it out of my hands. But what if other stuff happens? Allow one thing, a small thing, an easy thing to go to auto pay. And once you do that, you can start to loosen your grasp. Once you get that together, you can think about how many times you actually need to look at your finances, how many times you actually need to look at your schedule. You know, those of y'all who've looked at your calendar five times today, even though you knew that you was going to be in a a festival all day long, it's going to be all right. Now, if you answered B for one and A for two, you might be a paper chaser. Uh, sorry, would you want to talk a little bit about paper chasers? I mean, paper chasers, are it's, it's kind of in the name, but pa paper chasers... <laughs> Paper chasers are all about cash flow, right? And and making the money, having vision and seeking the money, moving forward with the money, right? The problem with paper chasers is that they tend to not be as good at saving, right? More money, no problems is is their motto. But it's it's important to put um, to put saving on on an auto plan, right? To oh, yeah, find so, so a way automating it but a little bit different from instead of auto paying a bill you want to automate automate savings. savings exactly so when i automate my savings is that something that like after i pay all my bills i can like figure out a way and then put it in there or like what, what should i be doing with that i mean it's different for different people it depends on your financial institution you know some financial institutions you can you can set up to put a certain amount of money from your checking account into your savings account every month um for other people, it can be, especially if you're in a cash business, if you're making a lot of money in cash, it can be like, okay, at the end of the day, I'm going to always put, right, this is something that I was doing when I was making a lot of money in cash, and I'm starting to do that again, actually, is like, put a certain amount from every shift that I'm getting paid in cash aside in an envelope and then take it to the bank, right? But just like, make sure that there's always a way to, to put something aside. Thank you for that specificity. You know, the reason why I was asking Sari to give you that imagery is because it's really difficult for us to think about paying ourselves first. You probably heard that term. People say it all the time, right? Pay yourself first. You got to pay yourself first. But what does that really mean when you got bills to pay, when you got people to take care of? And what that means is just what Sari has said, finding a percentage of money to put away, whether you make things in cash, whether it comes irregularly, whether it comes regularly, to make sure that you make money for your future self. 
when scientists do the brain scans of people and you think about your friends and your family and they have you know the parts of the brain light up when you think about yourself in the future you think about a completely different person so especially as paper chasers but really everybody we want to make sure that we can set up our future selves now if you answered a for one and b for two you might be a contemplator and contemplators similarly are the people who will do their future selves dirty. Because the contemplator is very much like the complicator. They're smart about money. They know how much the bills are and when they come in, except instead of having it in a spreadsheet, they got it all up in their head, which means it's a juggle. And what happens when that one bill goes up a little bit or that one bill goes down a little bit? You see, complicators, they tend to make sure that everything is a priority while the contemplator makes nothing a priority. So they're not keeping up with the bills. They don't know when they've changed numbers. And also, sometimes they slip. Sometimes they let one go. The thing with contemplators is y'all have a superpower. Contemplators are great when it hits the fan. When you need to improv and life is a mess and you just lost your gig and you're trying to figure it out, contemplators are great. If you are a contemplator or know a contemplator, you may have seen them do it in relationships where they start dating that person, especially those artists where they date that person who's bad for them so they can get their heart broke and write a great good song about it. I know I've been there. For <laughs> contemplators, we're also asking y'all to find things to automate. But instead of it being like the complicator where you're automating so you can let go, contemplators, we need you to automate so you can save your own behind. See, when things are late, when it comes to your bills, you can pay that late fee. And if you advocate for yourself, you can even call them up and be like, hey, I usually am not late. Can you reverse that fee? But once you let it go more than 30 days, then it's possible that your bill is going to go into collections and that could affect your credit. And that takes seven years to get it off your back. It's a broken mirror and all that. So what our contemplators need to do is find one bill especially that bill that you tend to forget about and make sure you put that to auto pay so that you can at least take care of your minimums. Now, if you answered B for one and B for two, you might be a money monk. Uh, many of us creatives and educators are money monks. Uh, to dispel the myth, it's not that we think that money is the root of all evil. That's not even the quote. The quote is love money is the root of all evil. But that's not even the point. It's that we think of money as a tool. I see, sorry, you're waving. Uh, I'm a money monk. I'm definitely a money monk. You're a money monk too, sorry, you're right? Can you tell me a little bit about what being a money monk has meant for you? Well, I think it's some for me, it's all summed up in, in thinking about money as the money. It's not my money or your money, mm -hmm. but the money, mm -hmm. right? Kind of like the man, right? And it's just something that I, like, I don't have a very long attention span to be able to talk about the money that is in my life, right? Like I start to short circuit pretty quick when I'm, when I'm thinking about my own finances um, for more than like 15 minutes at a time. And I also, like, as money monks, we tend to also be very generous, right? Like, mm -hmm. when I have, I just want to, like, when I have, I want to give to anybody who I care about who needs, right? Um, and that could be everything from just, like, giving money to people to, you know, buying stuff from my artist friends, you know? But, like, I, I'm very generous with, with money and not always thinking about covering my own behind. Well, it's funny how you say you want to buy stuff from your artist friends because the people you care about are the, are the places that you want to spend, send your money to because you're saying it's the money, but you still want to have a little control over it. Yeah, I, because I, I want to I want to support the things that are in alignment with my values. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is our big thing at pockets change is we want to make sure that your values what matters to you is what you spend your money on the, the best piece of financial advice i ever got in fact i should have added this slide i usually have it as a slide where you spend your money is a representation of what you value in other words you're always putting your money where your mouth is and i think it means the most to money monks i want to share a little bit about my money monk stuff to talk about where this comes from because people are always like well if this is my money personality shouldn't i just change it could I just be the better one? Shouldn't I be a paper chaser so I can make more money? Shouldn't I be the complicator so that I can look at my money? Shouldn't I be the contemplator so I can just not worry about it and live my life? Your money personalities are shaped by your experiences, oftentimes painful experiences, oftentimes to be real about it, actual trauma. I'll tell a little bit about mine. Um, so I'm mixed race and this matters because it matters to the story. My mom is black, um, American black, and my father is a Jewish uh, Russian immigrant. And I realized when my father died, when I was about 10 years old, that my dad's family was racist. 
they didn't like the whole black mom thing. So they did everything they could to keep money out of our hands. You know, the thing about money monks is we tend to be chameleons. We are whatever money personality at the time is needed for our peoples. And because my mom had no money and we were broke and living in a terrible little spot where roaches were crawling up in the fridge and freezer and everything like that. I remember one time where this roach died reaching in the freezer for the last soda that we had in the, in the john. And when we were living like that, I became a paper chaser. I had no thoughts about saving money, but I did everything that I could to make money so I could put some money in my mom's purse and maybe be able to take care of myself. By the time I became 17 and I finished school and I went off to college, I hated money. I didn't want to be a part of it. Whenever I got it in my hands, I let it go. I became a bit of a contemplator in that I just ignored stuff. I spent money on my people's. There was always the money monk present there, but otherwise I, I, I didn't care until I realized that the stuff that Sari was talking about, taking care of your community, taking care of your people, those things were important to me. And I can't actually do that while I'm throwing away every dollar that goes my way. Because if I'm in need, then my people have to bend over backwards to help me and I can't help them. If I'm in need and I don't ask for the money that I should be asking for, not just me, but everybody who does what I do, I've told you I'm a teacher, I'm, a, I'm an educator, I'm a musician, I do theater. All of the folks in those places, if they see me take less money, they'll end up taking less money too. I have a responsibility, not just to myself, but to everybody around me. And that taught me that if I really wanted to be the money monk that I felt inside me, I had to make decisions that benefited myself as well as my community. Because what happens to me will happen to everyone else. As we are in a financial crashing airplane sometimes, we need to make sure that we're able to put on our own gas mask first before we help out everybody else. So uh, I wanna take a, a quick minute and ask y'all to share some stuff in chat. Uh, I know we had like, we're running sort of on time because we ran in and out so we can keep this kind of short we don't have to do all of these things but i would love to hear a little bit about your money personality if you wanted to share a story about your money personality and action or if you wanted to just share how you feel because uh you know y'all are just coming into the room here i'm not sure that everyone who was in the room also got to take the quiz how you feel about your money personality if you feel that it is you if you feel it relates to you Feel free to share in chat. If you would like to unmute, raise your hand at any time. Saria, can you tell me a little bit about your relationship with being a money monk? Because I, I was telling you like the harrowing youth story that led my whole stuff. But tell me a little bit something about being a money monk. Uh, it can be something that you enjoy and love, or it can be something that, you know, you think is a challenge. Well, I mean, I think the main thing is that it is it is challenging for me to advocate for myself, right? That's why I specifically said, you know, having a money buddy makes it easier for me to not just talk with them, but then learn how to advocate for myself in, you know, in conversations with financial institutions or with people hiring me as an artist, etc. Right? Um, but I, you know, I I definitely have gone into the flip into the paper chaser side. Right. In order to. and But for me, the going into the paper chaser side has also in an interesting way been about me making the money so that I can do the, the money monking. Right. So I can do the the arting and giving to the community. It's like I go after the, after the funds so that I can pay my band so that I can pay for art from my friends that I want to have, you know, and I want to support. Um, I, I want to pause and, 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 and dial down a little bit on the thing that you were just saying. People like to talk a lot about your money monk type person, especially your artists and creatives, as people who, well, you're just blindly going about it and you don't see. And one thing about artists is you do see the big picture. Oh, I think oftentimes oh, yeah. we don't relate it to our finances, but what you were just talking about is how you not only saw the big picture in terms of like what you wanted to do with your career, what you wanted to do with your people, but also the numbers that got you there, right? Yes. And, you know, and very specifically going after having the finances in order to support the artistic community that helps me to make my work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I love that. Does that make sense? No, that, that makes perfect sense. I mean, the thing about it is 
when people, you know, folks like to talk about, oh, I did it all myself, but no one ever does it all by themselves, no. right? If you are rich and you start out with a lot of money, you certainly have your family support, you have support of the institutions around you. But even if you don't come from tons of money, your community is the one that gets you there. And that can mean your personal family, that can mean your neighborhood, that could mean your chosen family, your artist community, whatever that means to you. So doing those things together, it not only makes you money, but it feels good because it feels like you're doing the thing that matters to you. And again, when we talk about making money, not just like spending money, what is important to you is what you'll end up doing. It's great, thank you, thank you, thank you. Feel free to continue to share in the chat these feelings and thoughts that you're having about your personal finances. I know we're just jumping in and out the spot, but like, let's talk a little bit about these feelings. We have one more feelings they want to talk about. And then I want to talk about a practical tip before we get on out of here and get to this money jam that we're going to be doing. But why does saving feel hard to do? Saving feels hard to do, right? First of all, y'all know that there is not a, a social cue in the world for saving. Social cues are when we get rewards from our community, from our society for doing stuff. Like we get social cues for spending money. Hey, look at this, this blazer I got. Sorry, right? Isn't this nice? I spent some money on it and I got me this jacket. The only time, uh, scientists have studied this, by the way, smarter people than me dug into this. The only time we ever really talk about saving money, it's not actually when we save in money. Hey, sorry, you see this jacket I got? It was $100 less. It was 50% off. <laughs> I saved money. I didn't save money. I spent slightly less or I spent 50% less than I meant to spend, but that's not the same thing as saving. There's this idea that saving is passive, and that's not true. I want to take you through some more scientificals. There is this test that they did in the 60s called the marshmallow test, right? And uh, it was this, it's a real cute test. You can see it up on YouTube now where you go there and these kids get a marshmallow and they tell the kids that you can have one marshmallow now, or if you wait, like 15 minutes, something like that. I think the change is depending on who it is. You can get two marshmallows. And they determined in the 60s that the kids who waited for two marshmallows were the future leaders of tomorrow. They were better at handling their willpower. They were better at self-control. They were generally smarter and more adaptable kids. Well, 50-ish years later, more scientists decided to try to replicate the study. You know that a scientific study isn't accurate until it's able to be replicated several times. And what they found was it wasn't at all a predictor of your personal responsibility, but of your social economic class. In other words, and those of y'all who come from these places, y'all know, if you are told that you're gonna get something tomorrow and it doesn't come, should you expect it to happen again? If you're told, hey, we're gonna go on a trip, Tomorrow comes, the trip doesn't happen. Hey, I'm gonna get you some ice cream. Tomorrow comes, ice cream doesn't happen. When promises are repeatedly broken, it is logical for you to expect promises to be broken. Poor kids, kids who came from nothing, they ate that marshmallow because they know better. That second marshmallow could be a lie. When we think about why we're unable to or why we haven't made the right financial decision, a lot of times it comes from some stuff deeper than anything we thought that we knew about. It doesn't make us stupid. It doesn't make us wrong. And it doesn't make us alone. Even having these things in our bodies doesn't mean that we're gonna end up destitute and needing other people's help. It means that we just need to be aware of it, get control of it like our money personalities and start making the decisions that give us what we want. Building these habits, you know, habits themselves have a rhythm. We have this idea that habits are supposed to be a big, grandiose thing, right? Like, oh, I do the habits and I, I get everything I want out of it, but habits are small. And this is the evolution. It's three steps. I hate it. I don't hate it. I don't even think about it. Brushing your teeth. Most people in here brush their teeth, I'm assuming, right? We are, we're, we're, we're teeth brushing people. I remember being six years old and not wanting to brush my teeth. And my mom, mom elect is like, you better brush your teeth. And I'm like, I don't want to brush my teeth. And like, go you brush your teeth, boy. And I'll go into the bathroom and I'd run the water for 30 seconds. And I, I could have just brushed my teeth, but I'm like being defiant. I was like, yeah, I don't want to brush my teeth. And then I start getting older and I'm going to school and I'm eight and I'm nine. And I don't want to be the dragon breath kid. That's always right. They're like, oh, that kid's got the dragon breath. Stay away from that kid. So I start brushing my teeth. They're for grudging. And I'm like, mm -hmm, I'm doing it. And nowadays I get up in the morning and I brush my teeth 
I, I don't even think about it. Actually, uh, to be honest, I have a two and a half year old and he's just started brushing his teeth. He gets on a step stool. So I think about it and do it with him, but I'm building his habit. He's not even going to remember the fact that I got him on the step stool to get going. He's just going to know I brush my teeth. It's a thing I do. To be able to build these habits, there are three steps, and that is creating the musical rhythm, the rhythm that they have. There's the mnemonic of rhyme that aid in your memory. There's the mantras, like the money mantras we talked about before that calm you down, and even alliteration, which we are also using with our money mantras, giving you a, a sense of order. When, oh, I love this from Megan. Yes, yeah, start small, right? Little by little. That's the thing. The thing about saving habits especially is that saving is an action, not an amount. So if you're building a habit of saving, the rhythm of your saving that you're building, to be real practical about what I'm saying, is you don't have to worry about how much you put away. You just have to worry about when you put it away. Sarya was talking about finding a regular amount to put away from her paycheck, from when she got cash gigs and things like that. If you know weekly, monthly, every time you get the big gig, you're putting away a certain amount of money, even if it's only $10, that will build. And once you realize, hey, I'm able to put away $10, little by little, then you're like, I'm, maybe let me try put away $20. And then once that feels good to you, and that feels easy, and you don't even miss it, now let's try 50, now 100. And before you know it, you've got a bunch of money in there. To make that happen is reps. Just like when you're lifting weights, you have to do it repeatedly. And just like lifting weights, it hurts at first and feels silly. I keep saying the word like stupid because uh, you know I don't think anyone here is, but we often think that we are. And you'll look at that money. You put away $25 a month for three months. That's $75. That's one nice night out. And you're like, man, I should do that. I should just go out. You have to continue doing that rep, building up that muscle until it feels like, ah, it's fine, 75. Now it's 7,500 in there. The reward is why we start. We want to let go of the reward and just be saving for saving's sake. But at first, please find something that matters to you. Please find something that matters to you. Is it the house? Is it a fancy car? Is it six months off to go somewhere nice and just write that book that you've ever wanted to write? Or, or, or not even write a book, maybe just six months off to just chill and be able to be yourself. Think of that thing and that will give you the steps that you need to build the habits that you want. When we understand our relationship with money, we take action with our tendencies in mind. Uh, I'm trying, I'm rushing a little bit because I know we, we lost some time there, but sorry, would you want to wrap a little bit about habits and what that relates to you and your finances? Um, do you have a specific question about habits? Yeah, I know. I was just like, oh, I'm flying past this. Let me, let me go back to the habit stuff. Um, when it comes to your habits, we were talking before about you putting your paycheck away regularly. Um, when did you get to the point where it was easy for you to do that? Because I know the first time it wasn't easy. Do you even remember? Or was it like after the fact, you're like, oh, I've just been putting it away. I mean, I'm a very project and goal oriented person. So for me, it really has to do with the the why, right? The like, what is in my yes box, right? Like if we if we have- Yeah, yeah, we're uh, gonna get to that in a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we'll get to that in a second, but what's in my yes box? What is, what is, what is future sorry a, you know, enjoying? What is future Saria saving for? And um, when I really keep that in mind, then it it becomes almost like a joyful thing, <laughs> right? Yes, that yes. action. Because I, that, you know, the thing that I am saving for, you know, and I'll be honest, like I have not gotten to a place in my own life where I am officially saving for retirement, right? Mm -hmm. Like I don't have that. That is not currently in, in my yes box reality. We're getting there, right? Mm -hmm. But for me, it's like very, for it's very specific things, whether it's a trip, usually it has to do with my art, right? Like specifically in, you know, in the recent past was to go to, to Berlin to finish recording an album, right? And it was yes. like, Right. It was like I needed I, that album needed to happen. <laughs> right. And that album needed to happen for my own well-being, but also for my career. And so it was just always putting it aside. The album's right? called Breaking Shadows. You can hear it on all platforms. Thank you. Dear. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, but on the real, the thing that you were saying um, about being goal oriented, I also think is an important thing. This is one of the workshops that we do a deeper dive into in other places. But when it comes to our goals, we 
it, goal oriented, I guess it implies the idea that some people aren't oriented towards their goals. And we all can be. Being a goal oriented person means that it's better for you to be able to write down your goals and to have that as like a, a drishti, like they have in yoga, you know, the thing that you look at that will hold you down. I'm the opposite way. I don't know if I ever told you this, sorry, new information for the teachers in the room. Uh, I'm, if I write down my goals and make a big thing about it, there's a psychological thing. It's something that I don't even really understand the math on that makes me feel like I've already accomplished it. So when I write down my goals, it gives me less inspiration to go for them. So that's something else that when we're figuring out our money personalities, finding out about ourselves is does it benefit us to make a big plan around our goals or do we need to just careen on towards whatever we're going towards next? Um, I want to ask folks, we're going to take another, I want to take 30-ish seconds, share uh, the last five things in chat that you spent money on. If uh, you gambled and lost, if you lent money to a friend, whatever money left your hand, the last five things you can remember, feel free to cheat and to go into your bank stuff if you need to, but uh, try to pull it out of the back of your head. I'll give you some time. I'll do a, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, really, it's very interesting for all of us and helpful if you do drop it in the chat, right? Yeah, yeah, if you, yeah. Please, if please. you feel comfortable, please do share it in the chat because it, it, this is part of us being money buddies for each other, y'all. Yeah, so, we're, we're going to do a, a little practical thing before we get out and start jamming. And uh, I would love for y'all to share that. Uh, sorry, what are the last five things that you bought? Do you remember? Um, this morning I went down the street to my bodega in New Orleans called Mardi Gras Zone and I bought eggs because I needed eggs. Um, I bought gas. Uh, I'm drawing blanks. I know. I'm drawing blanks. I bought gas. Um, uh i bought uh little things to put up the mirrors in my dance studio space here oh yeah the little screws yeah the little the little like screws with the plastic thing that helps hold the mirror on the wall i love it i love it yep 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 that was yesterday um i haven't been out spending that much money recently oh i went i went out to a meal with a, a good friend of mine right yes, you know I, i'm i'm Y'all, some of y'all have been able to throw a lot in there. Some of y'all, I want to let you know, this is part of the trick. It's hard to think of the last few things that you spent money on because of the ways that our brains work. So I want to share this. This is something else that we do a lot at Pockets Change. And this is, ooh, I'm seeing really good stuff in the chat here, by the way. Beers on a night out with some friends. I love the yes. specificity. KFC, street food, groceries, paying Cell for the phone bill, car right? battery. There's a lot of different stuff. There's a lot of details and basics happening in here, dialect. So if anybody, uh, yeah, sorry, it's getting Tuition. the way of the right now. Um, so... If any of y'all are business majors or were business majors, you may recognize this as the urgent important matrix. Excuse me, I'm mispronouncing the urgent important matrix that is used for decision making. And we think that it's a great way to figure out what matters to you before you start budgeting. Because I don't like budgets. I remember when I first made a budget and I wrote down all of my bills and I was told to live spartanly. And then it was like, well, then I guess I can't spend money on anything else. And I put the budget away and it didn't actually affect my life. I put a budget together for my food. It said $200. You can spend $200 a month on food. And I put all the stuff into my e-budget and mint.com where they make all the pie charts and the graphs and everything like that. And it was all fun and nice. And at the end of the month, I spent 250 on food and nothing happened. <laughs> I, it was just like, it gave me a red mark and said I was wrong. And I was like, well, forget you. And then I stopped budgeting because it didn't matter. I was still going to buy the food because I was still hungry. You're still going to buy the things that you want. The budget is not a budget or is not a useful tool unless it's a guide for what you really want. So before we even start budgeting, let's figure out what we want. And the spending values matrix will allow us to do that. Now, some of y'all have put these in there, but the first part is the basics. Basics are pretty easy. Basics are your bills. That's the gas. That's the groceries. Those are the things that you literally need to live to get by in your life. Sometimes it's things related to work, like your cell phone and internet and things like that too. These are often known as your fixed expenses. And a lot of times we're told that we should budget for those things, but it's, that's just the beginning. What I want y'all to do is to take that and put it to the side. Once you got that number, put it away. You need to know the number of your expenses, but put that away, your fixed expenses. And I want you to focus on the next part. Sorry, can we talk a little bit about the details? 
You were yeah, already going into them earlier. Yeah, the details are the things that that you need in your life to feel like yourself, right? To enjoy life, not like on a humongous level. That's more of like the yes box stuff that we'll get to in a minute. But um, like I mentioned, I went out to dinner with a friend, right? That's not part of the basics. Like I, I will not die if I do not have that, right? Mm-hmm. I will not. I, I, it's not part of my absolute necessities for you know shelter and sustenance. But it, it, it helps me to have an enjoyable moment of life and connection, right? Other things that we have here, are like video games or sneakers and nails right getting your nails done might be something that's really important for your sense of self your sense of well-being i'm seeing Um, in chat here like beers out on a night with my friends exactly Uh, right um so it's the details are the things that we need in our life to enjoy our life and to feel like ourselves so that we can show up at 100 percent for our jobs for our family for our community etc you know yeah you know when you're tired right when you're tired you can't get nothing done you can't get your work done when you're tired when you're worn out and being physically tired and worn out is one thing, but being emotionally tired and worn out it's is worse. a real thing too. Well, it, it, well it, it, more importantly, it's real. I think folks often act like it's not real, right? Like, oh, just get over your emotional stuff. True. But really, we have a finite amount of willpower. Sorry, was just talking about how even looking at her finances will drain her and make it so she can't think anymore. The details are the things that you buy that replenish that willpower. This is literal scientific stuff of you finding ways to spend energy, time, and yes, money on the things that matter to you. And what's interesting about that is that when you try to not se- spend money on these details, cause you know, you're often told not to spend money on them. There's best selling books telling you, don't buy that latte, don't buy that cookie, don't buy those sneakers, don't buy that game and that's how you'll be rich. But when you don't spend money on those things, when you be good, and, and stave off the guilt, I'm gonna tell you something, you end up spending that money anyway, and you spend it in the nothing. If you look at it, it's the same stuff, eating out with friends, video games, sneakers, whatever, but it's not the stuff that matters to you. How many of y'all have gone to the store to buy the thing you want and it's sold out and you end up spending that money anyway? on random stuff. How many of y'all have gone to an Ikea or CVS kind of place? And there's like, oh, well, I I just came for this one thing. And then you end up with all this other random stuff. When we are worn out, when our willpower is low, that's when we get tricked. That's when we get messed up. (laughs) They say he's talking to me. Yeah, yeah, yo. yo, Those of y'all who feel called out, it's real, yo. And it's not because of you. It's because you're tired. It's because you've been running yourself ragged. It's because they're predators. You know, people think that it's our fault while we buy random fast food. People think that it's because we're lazy. No, it's because we're worn out. And marketing is real. Marketing is real. Red and yellow makes you hungry. And so McDonald's uses red and yellow. Yo, everybody does. Carl's Jr., in and out like every restaurant. Wells Fargo. Well, it's Fargo the bank because they trying to get you like that too. But you're smart. You know this. You don't get caught up except when you're worn out, except when you're tired. There's a Popeye's chicken near me. And, you know, I live in New York City where we ride the subway and my subway goes right above Popeye's. And usually I'm fine. But that day when I had too many kids wiling out, when I was up late last night recording, when I don't have my stuff together, it gets me. And it's not because I'm dumb. It's because I'm worn out. We spend money in our details to make sure that we can stave off the nothing. And I promise you, if you make a plan for the things you love, you can spend more money on them, spend less in the nothing. You're never gonna spend nothing in the nothing. There's always gonna be something that you're randomly spending money on. But when you get that together, all that money that you save can go into the last one that Saria was alluding to earlier. That is, oh, I don't even have the thing for it. Is the uh, yes box. Yeah, the yes box. The yes box. The big green one. Yeah. The yes box, um, which is, you know, what, like we were saying, you know, saving for your future self, right? Whatever, whatever that, there's a lot of things that that, that can mean. Um, do you want to say more about that? And then dialect, I want to respond to something real quick in the, that's happening in the chat. 
Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Most definitely. So yeah, the last the, the S box practically, because I know we have to get out of here because you know we ran late and everything. Um, the last thing the yes box practically translates to a savings account. And what it is is this is the paying yourself first thing. Before you get any other bills, before you pay anything else, you find a number that you're able to put away for yourself. Once you've taken care of the basics, once you know what your details are, you can figure out the thing that we we're talking about, that six months off, that big house, whatever it is that you want, and start saving towards that. And then uh, I know we have to get out of here in a minute. Um, we have time for the jam, but sorry, you wanted to shout out something in the chat? Yeah, there's just there's a conversation about, you know, uh, the whether or not to buy the latte, right? Oh, it's yeah, happening yeah, in yeah. the chat. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I just want to say, like, there is something real about about saying, like, you know, I'm not going to have the latte every day right like not you know not splurging on things all the time right i think the thing about the details that's important is like making it a little bit of a ritual mm -hmm. making sure that like if you think that starbucks is a terrible business because of their practices mm -hmm. then you don't buy it at starbucks right you buy it at a place that you want to support their business practices and like you sit down and like you with the latte and you like enjoy the latte even right? if it's a dollar like, more right even if it's right. like that, yeah. And maybe you just do it once a month or once a week or whatever instead of every single day, but you turn it into a ritual so you really have a moment with the enjoyment of it instead of it just being a mindless thing where you're shelling out the $5 or whatever. Yeah, basically we want to finish with that. When it comes to our spending money on the things that matter to us, yes, like Nicholas is saying, conscientious consumerism. Yes. Be aware of what you're doing. What I ask you, if you're like, I don't know how to start, when you go to buy something, next few things you go to buy, before you buy it, ask yourself why. Why am I buying it? It's okay if you still buy it, but continue to ask yourself why. And you'll be able to start finding these values and these things that matter to you. I want to thank you all for jamming with us today. Again, my name is Dialect. My name is Saria. And we have been Pockets Change. If you go to pocketschange.com, we have a lot of free lessons and lots of good vibes for you. Too. So we're going to be doing this money jam. There's going to be taking little pieces from what we had going on before, and we're going to be sharing a few things. I know we were talking about um, Father Denroy Morgan coming and sharing some ideas, tunes, and vibes. He wasn't able to be here physically in person, but I have a little clip that was shared from the crew, uh, a little bit of music and a little bit of him on his farm doing his thing. So we're going to check him out real quick. And we'll be in a minute, back in a minute doing some jams. By the way, if anybody here in the audience, I think we can make this happen, um, does want to come and jam with us, you've got some music, you've got some art. I know we have some visual artists. I'm happy to see visual things you got too that you want to share. Let us know in chat and we'll make that happen. But until then, I'm going to shut myself up for a minute and just I just made a mistake that I'm going to stop doing because I forgot to put on the screen, share the sound so y'all could hear the sound. Now y'all can hear it. You see all your water? And you see how it come? All right. No, I'll show you how to reap now. Cut it from the bottom, my son. You hold the knife, take it from the bottom, and cut it close to the dirt. Yeah? Show them where you're in. So last year I popped you all this. Eh? More vegetables. Reap again, Lazar. Yes. Yes. Hot. <laughs> Go up there, so reap again, Lazar. <laughs> reap. <laughs> so last year. Hot. <laughs> Lazar. Uh, I call you now. Let me show you how you cut color. See that? You see how much you do? Mm -hmm. You don't want to cut it way up here. Mm -hmm. You don't want to cut it way down here. So. You cut it right here. So. Hot. That means you left that for grow like how we left that for grow now. Mm -hmm. You go now and grip some color for me. <laughs> ja. Use the one this guy. Yeah. I hit that. Right spot. Mm -hmm. Right spot. I hate that. Ah, hey, show over, no more.
one by one and two by two. So that was Father Dan Roy Morgan. You know, uh, I love that they were cutting Callaloo Bush. Uh, y'all hear me yanking here. You know, I was born in the States, but I grew up on St. Croix in U.S. Virgin Islands. And I remember when I graduated high school and my mother said that she would cook me a cal- The only time she ever made me a Kalalu soup was there. And we had to go out into the bush, me and my friends, and pick up the bush and pick it. It was like a little small leaf. And we're picking, picking, picking to get all of these leaves to make that bush. So that was bringing me back. And it's beautiful how we can look at the vegetation that is our form of sustenance and think about no matter what industry history you're in that we can pick and speaking of picking uh, we got Saria here with guitar to pick yeah yeah you see oh you you saw my transition I had the transition going on (laughs) you are all about words dialect I got the segue but I'm gonna shut up and let Saria do some jamming with you so um dialect mentions that um in in my yes box for a while both on a personal and um business tip was my album breaking shadows right that i recorded partially in berlin um and this is the first song i'm gonna do a a shorter version of it but this is the first song on that album called shine and it's um it's it's very much about learning how to advocate i've been saying that a lot right but learning how to advocate for ourselves how to not feel pressed down by the systems that are designed to not empower us right but how to to find a way to be empowered and to shine and the chorus is shine oh shine you'll hear it Don't unmute yourselves because it'll be crazy. But if you feel like singing along so that you can feel empowered to shine your best self. And while you sing shine, maybe you'll think about shining your money mantra that you made this morning with dialect. But this is shine. divide and conquer serving a digitized master chasing after numbers what truth do they tell you isolate rip apart imperfections stare down society's reflections bloody past bloody present but your own health you've gone neglecting power always placed outside amassing wealth for consumer pride your fortress piled high with useless things once made you smile you're warring with yourself on best actions to move cultural wealth out hands of greed's manipulation but with your sisters engage competition you can't dispel dark feeling unworthy of love no you can't dispel dark feeling unworthy of love so rise up star to some you're a sun yeah rise up star to some you're a sun and shine into evening like the midday sun reflecting like the morning star into evening like the midday sun no you can't dispel dark feeling unworthy of love no you can't dispel dark feeling unworthy of love so rise up star to some you're a sun yeah rise up star to some you're a sun no you can't dispel dark feeling unworthy of love no you can't dispel dark feeling unworthy of love so rise up star to some you're a sun yeah rise up star to some you're a sun and shine yourself in your space shine do yeah shine Do do da da do de de, ba do do da. 
Lovely. <laughs> Thank you. I hope y'all feel inspired to shine your best selves, to advocate for yourselves, to create a vision of light and lusciousness for your lives. This is what we wanted, right? All that brunch and budget and it wasn't for nothing. It's a dream house, good block. Other than the mortgage, we don't got nothing else to worry about, right? Okay, so here's the basics. Debt is an obligation. A deferred payment. Your cash is low, so we made an arrangement. Stores used to give credit. Bars would open a tab. But only if they trust you and know that you pay it back. But it's more than that. Debt is the American dream. It's a house, car, and fancy degree that you need. But nowadays, employers don't care about a diploma. They just want to know that you got experience and begin your gut. You know what? Debt can be a burden. Especially when black women are paid like three fifths of a person. 61 cents on the dollar to pay for college debt is holding black Americans hostage. The way of life is gamified. If you're not winning, you're miserable. They keep it in cash to call your credit invisible. Ellison, we owe our ancestors a moral debt. 20% of black net worth is worth less. Ain't nothing going on but the rent in a six pack. It's 760 next to 62 on a dating app. We wait for reparations, but I don't expect them to pay us back. There's a reason getting out of debt gets you in the black. You don't have, make sure you don't tell nothing to no man. You gotta make a home even without a road map. But you ain't on no map until you own that. My mama said, Don't spend money you don't have. Make sure you don't tell nothing to no man. You gotta make a home even without a road map. But you ain't on no map until you own that. Credit was started with BS and rumors. Boomers build up the Zoomers and make them authorize users. We're socialized to ostracize these maneuvers. Cause it's tough to fight for the future and keep your eye on abusers. That's poor tax and more facts and war on black banks. From Friedman and Don Frank, we're more than half tanked. We give thanks and praise to the shanks from snakes. Go for me and Reddit when people need to be saved. Look who gets to choose who's too big to fail. The best friends with the ones who choose who go to jail. We converse into commissary, they check in our mail. Aided by hyperbole to call it beyond the pale, get it? Credit scores wasn't even a thing till 89. Before that, they relied on prejudice and lies. A bunch of companies who competed until they didn't. American dreamed up a caste system for richness. None of us know the formula or the way that they calculated, but we give a sweat for a brow for this evaluation. It's a score because it's a game. If you in debt, you get in play, but you already get in play, so get in the game, okay? They said debt is a burden. If you in debt, you wrong. If you in debt, you need to be absolved. But debt is still the way that this world goes round. America runs on debt. So if you running on debt, just make sure it doesn't run over you. That was a jam from me. And now... My turn. Sorry I finished what she doing. I finished what my doing. So it's y'all turn. Turn this up here. You hear me? Give me your money mantra. Give me your money yeah. mantra. Give me your money mantra. Yeah. Give me your money mantra. Give me your money mantra. Now, you have to keep yourself muted. Cause everything in this world is abusive and they can't hear your mantra the mantra is only for you your answer so keep it to yourself but share it with yourself while we here got the rhythm say your money mantra make sure you listen what was mine breaking barriers breaking barriers 
breaking barriers. I started with B's, breaking barriers. If you want to go to A, or go to the next letter, whatever it is that you have that you want to share, say it to yourself. I was breaking barriers, but if I also wanted to activate abundance, or call in some cash, or dream up some dollars, everything will ever last. You can find your face, or maybe even find your faith. You can rhyme for what's great. You can have hope, but never have hate. You can be interest and intact. You can live this and live back. I don't have to go through the rest of the alphabet for y'all to understand the facts. Find your money mantra. We want you to find your money mantra. Find your money mantra. I'm gonna shut up for y'all. Just say your money mantras now. One more game. Whoop! Watch out. Make money, make money. Save money, save money. Share money, share money. Make the money, don't let it make you ugly. Work, make money, make money. S save money, save money. Share money, share money. Make money, don't let it make you ugly. I would like to thank everybody for coming and jamming with us. Yes, make money, save money, share money. Don't let it make you ugly. Do what you're doing to build the things that we need from foundation will grow the skyscrapers. I want to thank everybody for jamming with us. I want you to continue to jam in yourself, in your heart, with your people, in your community. Find these money buddies, make more. Now that we hyped up, I think we're ready for, I think we got the physical fitness, the physical finance stuff together for the next jam. So I'm excited about that. Happy to be a participant. Thank you all so much. If you want to know more, you can reach out at pocketschange.com. My name is Dialect. This is Saria. We have music and art available at all sorts of platforms. Feel free to listen to us, support us, and collaborate with us. We love to jam with y'all. I dropped some of our links in the chat so you can find our music if you would like to. Thank you so much, y'all.